Some years ago, Frederick Buechner wrote a book called The Sacred Story. It was an autobiography. A lot of people said at the time, who's Frederick Buechner? And why is his story sacred? It was a little bit of a debate in the church. And I had, I had a friend in the Gross Point Church that I served in said, I, I know Freddie Buechner. I grew up with him. He just thinks he's important. I don't know why he's writing a book called The Sacred Story. Well, the book had quite an impact because Buechner proposed something in the book that now is widely accepted. And that is that the story of our lives are sacred because God is intimately involved in our lives. God is shaping our lives. And so those stories take on a very sacred quality to them. Each of us has a story to share. Each of us grew up in a particular time, in a particular family, and there are particular circumstances and events which have shaped our story of what we would call our life story or our brief autobiography. We, I was in a group and we used to write autobiographies, brief autobiographies, and they were very interesting the way people put them together. But Buechner had the courage to call his life sacred not because he was special or famous, although, ironically, the book made him rather, rather famous, uh, but because he was taking his life seriously and he was taking God's work in his life seriously. Today in Savoring Sabbath, we'll be sharing stories and following up in this tradition. Some years ago, I went to the Adler School of Professional Psychology. I enjoyed going there. And one of the things that the um, Adlerians were, were teaching was something called early recollections. And the idea was that you would ask a client what stories they remembered from the ages of three to seven. Those were called early recollections. It had to be a specific story. It couldn't be a general thing. And what they found when they asked people these early recollections is they often followed a very distinct pattern. The stories were essentially the same story, told in a little bit different ways. And there was always an element of who am I in the story and who is my ideal self and who are the people in my life, and what are they like, and what is the world like? And these were the elements that came out in these early, uh, early recollections and these early stories. So there was significant meaning in the way people remembered their lives and the kinds of things that they remembered. And the stories themselves were uh, meaningful uh, descriptions of how they saw themselves in the world. Some people saw the world as dangerous. Some people saw themselves as heroes in their own stories, in a sense. Some people were absent in their own stories. Some people, other people were hostile or friendly. It's very interesting stuff. Sometimes we tell stories of our lives we are telling on multiple levels, but there's meaning there. And if there's not much meaning, hopefully it's funny, because otherwise the story's not... My grandmother, I've told about, uh, Sidney McKee, and he would tell these stories, and they would go on and on and on. They had no meaning or humor. He would go on and on and talk about road trips. You know, he'd been to South Dakota and took route something or other, and then he would go here and there, and you're always waiting for the punchline and the meaning. There's nothing. I mean, he, he was funny in a sense. Uh, my aunt called him Jonathan Winters. Because there was a little man from Dayton, Ohio, that used to sit on the porch, and Sydney was from Dayton. When I ask people what brought them to Christ, they often tell me that they were in search of meaning. It wasn't so much that they, they felt uh, sinful or they, that they felt the weight of the world in terms of their own moral corruption, but they felt that their life was in pieces and that they needed meaning in their life. They felt lost. They felt at sea. And... In becoming a Christian, their life took on a new organization, a new meaning, and, and they felt a new significance. And their personal story began to make sense to them as they came to understand God's salvation purposes. Everything changed. Their relationships changed. And their work took on meaning. On the other hand, sometimes we carry myths about ourselves, and sometimes we have stories that are mythological. Often our stories are keys to understanding that self-understanding. Author Edward Wimberly has some interesting things to say about recollection of stories, of how our stories form and change. And it can be important that our narrative changes over time as we mature. He says, we have lesser stories or sub-myths that often take the center stage of our life, 
And this happens when we suffer loss of meaning or loss of directions. And when the sub-stories take over, we are in trouble because the central story has lost its place of prominence in our life. And our life is now being guided by this sub-story that's replaced it. I think this often happens when people mis, uh, uh, misunderstand themselves or underestimate themselves. They don't realize how good they are or the potential that's within them or what God is, is trying to do in them. Today we come to the part of Philippians, which is <clears throat> the core of the gospel story. It's a hymn of praise to Jesus, a hymn which Paul the Apostle has borrowed from the early tradition in the church, and he has placed it in his letter to the Philippians. And it's a poetic hymn of the story of Jesus. Paul wants to be certain we do not lose sight of the one who emptied himself and became human for us. On our behalf, Christ became empty and went to the cross in obedience for us and then is glorified. And Paul puts it in this relational context. He says, in your relationships, not his exact words, but in, his, in your relationships, have the same mind as Jesus Christ. Be like Jesus in your relationships. So in other words, as you have the attitude of Christ, <clears throat> as you see Christ's life, your own life can begin to, to take the shape of that pattern. He describes the servant role of Christ in a kind of progressive descent. Jesus descended from heaven to earth. He descended from heaven to humanity, from the place of being human to the cross. And from the cross, the creeds tell us, not here, but in the creeds, to hell. Jesus descended to hell, the creeds say, because there was no limit that he would not go for us. To speak of his humility is not quite it. To speak of Christ's obedience is not quite it. Re even to speak of his love isn't really quite it because the word love in the human language has kind of lost a lot of its juice. It's used so commonly. He emptied himself for us. What words do we have for it? It's really in the story. It, it, it's hard to put out a proposition or to make a statement which makes it explainable. You have to read the story. Paul is telling us that we are called to discover the same pattern in our lives. Perhaps we have stories of humility and grace and love, stories of the old self dying, stories of self emptying, stories of servanthood, of ways that we have learned servanthood and how we have found new meaning in our lives because we have discovered servanthood that led to something else powerful in our lives, self-offering. Consider your own life. Perhaps you've been uh, at times uh, riding a wave of success and then you got knocked down off your horse. I suppose that's happened to most of us. And then God used that experience of your getting knocked down. It can be a powerful experience. Perhaps you've tried the myth of superiority. I've never been real good at that one, but the myth of superiority, and somehow that's knocked out of you. And God uses that to teach you a deeper humility and a, a deeper centeredness and value in life. You found the attractiveness of service. There's something about people who are self-absorbed that's very off-putting. You know, we learn from the negative examples, too. You know, those that are so full of themselves and so full of pride what we call narcissists. So, although we have a narcissistic society, there's some that just are so full of themselves. and It's really off-putting, isn't it? We meet those kinds of folks. Paul will go on in the next section of the Philippians to further illustrate how Jesus, the Jesus story can form our own stories and how it's formed his story as, as he considers his life as, as a poured-out libation, how, how he feels that his life is, is one of being poured out in service to the world and how he has found life as he's given up his old life. And that's much of the Pauline story. And then he talks about uh, um, Timothy as well as an example. 
I'm reminded by a man by the name of O.G. Phillips. O.G. Phillips was an African-American pastor that I met early on in my ministry, and his favorite expression was, it's all grist for the mill. He would say it over and over again. He had his little mantras. I had him for clinical pastoral education. And he meant that God takes all the stuff of our life, and it's all grist for what God is making. The good stuff, the bad stuff, the ugly stuff. All the stuff of our life is potential for what God can use in our life to form us. And then there was Peter Gnomes, the African-American from Harvard, the professor, who talked about the, the black churches and, and the history of the black churches. And he said, why did black people who had so little to sing about, who knew so little joy in either the slave-holding South or the brutal racial boundaries of the North, sing so much? Were they trying to escape? Were their lives dull? He says the gospel churches got happy because they knew themselves to be in the thin place between this world and the next, and they knew that they had a title to the mansion on high. Don't you love that? They knew that they had a title to the mansion on high. In the midst of their suffering, they felt the glory of God raising them up the gospel music. There have been countless people who have impacted my life. I think one of the really, one of the blessings of being a pastor is that you get to meet people in, the, in different critical times of their life. You know, when they're having their baby baptized or they're getting married or they're going through a struggle or, or even as they're facing their own mortality. And, you, and people are often, you see their courage and their buoyancy and their their strength, the strength of their faith in those critical moments. And that's one of the great blessings of being a pastor. And then I think of other people who have impacted my life, of authors that I've read and, and that I've kind of attached myself to. George MacDonald is one. And then there are the contemporary figures. And I want to talk a little bit about a contemporary figure that you all know, and perhaps you don't know his life very well, but you certainly all know him. And he's impacted my life in some ways. And I started to read his autobiography. I've never read it. I found it in the church library. We have a really good church library here. Maggie's not here for me to brag about her, but Maggie does a really great job of taking out the junk and leaving some really nice books in there. I mean, most church libraries, quite frankly, are terrible. And yours is really good. It's really good. And I, I, maybe you're all responsible. I don't know. But people tend to bring their worst books and they give them to the church and they go into the church <laughs> library. Maggie sorts through and she throws out all those. You've got some good ones. But anyway, this is an autobiography by Billy Graham, Just As I Am. And I've never been to a Billy Graham crusade in my whole life. You know, probably some. How many of you have been to a Billy Graham crusade? Yeah, I bet that was an interesting and powerful experience for you. Well, my experience was with Billy Graham was that he... Uh, he was involved with my seminary. He was on the board of trustees of Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, where I went. And he was a friend of Harold Ockengay, who was the president at that time, although Harold was coming toward the end of his career. And when I came forward for my graduation to receive my diploma, and J.I. Packer, the great British theologian, had preached, and it was a sermon to remember, believe me. Billy Graham did not preach. He prayed a very short prayer, very powerful, and Harold Ockengay said a few words, but they were all on the stage when you came up to get your diploma. And when you came up to get your diploma, Billy Graham looked you in the eye like, you're going to make it, brother. I mean, you know, those piercing blue eyes and that intense look of Billy Graham looking right at you. You're going to do it. I know it. You know, and I was like, yeah. <laughs> Billy believes in me. It's a very powerful moment, very short, but what an impact of his life that he had. One of the things I learned about him is, well, you know, Billy Graham was not an intellectual, and so when he came to New England, and, and he liked to come to New England, and he liked to preach to college students, he'd like to go to Harvard and MIT and Yale and all these places, and New Englanders think they're brilliant, you know, they they're, think they're intellectuals. I don't know if they are or not. Some of them are smart, but there's a little bit of a milieu there. And he would get Harold Ockengay to introduce him because he'd say to Harold, say, Harold, I'm not an intellectual. I can't talk to these people. I don't know what to say. You know, I'm just a, a boy from North Carolina. You know, I'm just a hick from North Carolina. 
So Harold Ockengay would get up and he would give these intense academic and intellectual introductions, you know, about science and how science was taking over the world of, and how faith, and he would talk about culture and society and this very academic intellectual. And then Billy Graham would just get up and drive it home. And they would listen to every word that he said. And he also uh, preached, uh, I think he did a crusade in Boston Common, and, and Harold Ockengay was um, the pastor of the famous Park Street Church. And the Park Street Church, if you've ever been to Boston, has the pulpit on the outside. It has a pulpit on the inside, but it also has a pulpit that faces Boston Common. Because when it was built in 1740, the idea was that the preacher was supposed to stand, and it's very high up, the preacher was supposed to stand on the outside of the church and preach to the common, the public. So I don't know if Billy Graham got to preach from that or not. It might have fallen off. It was an old church. But it was part of the deal that Ockengay um, was kind of setting him up and working with him. And then I learned some things about his growing up, which I found fascinating. I, I knew this before, actually, that Billy Graham, he, he first went to Bob Jones University. And I don't know if you know anything about what was Bob Jones College or Bob Jones University, but it's very rigid. And, and you know, if you went on a date, you were allowed to be with a girl for 15 minutes supervised. And it was timed, and at the end of 15 minutes, that was the end of the date. And the, it was so rigid, and it just drove Billy Graham crazy. So he convinced his parents he wanted to go to this place called the Florida Bible Institute, which was not real great academia, but they had nice golf down there, and Billy had a great time, you know, and he kind of got his color back, and he kind of became human again. He kind of became Billy again. And, and while he was on there, he started preaching again in all these small churches because Billy Graham loved to preach. He preached in high school. He preached in college. I mean, by the time he was done with college, he'd probably preached hundreds of sermons, you know. I started preaching in, like after seminary, you know. I was like, oh, I'm not sure I want to do that. But Billy Graham, he just had it in his bones, Probably at 10 years old, he was preaching in the living room. And um, a Chicago lawyer by the name of Paul Fisher heard Billy preach. And he said, you know, you should go to Wheaton College. And not only that, not only should you go to Wheaton College, but I'm going to pay for your education to go to Wheaton. And Billy said, well, so he went to Wheaton College. And then he met Ruth Bell, and he got involved with the Bell family, and you know, and the Bell family were very powerful uh, Christians and, and, and had a very powerful faith. His father-in-law had a great impact on him. And, and Billy said, when I got to Wheaton, I felt like a hick. This is what he says in his autobiography. I doubted there was anybody in the class as green as I was. I was older than most of the students. My clothes were out of style. And I had that North Carolina accent. They thought I was a hick. I was tall and lanky, and I didn't fit in. But instead of going to class, he went down to this place called the United Gospel Tabernacle, and he preached, and he preached, and he kept preaching. And Billy Graham, if you think about it, was a pretty ordinary guy. And he thought of himself as a pretty ordinary guy. And that's what I love about his story. I mean, he... He has this humility. I mean, how many people do you know who have been that successful in gospel ministry? I mean, most of the great preachers and the great television evangelists, they, they go up on this, you know, success ladder and then they ruin their lives and do stuff, dumb stuff. Billy Graham has somehow maintained humility through it. The hick from North Carolina that God used. When we think about our own stories, it'll be helpful to read Christian biographies and autobiographies to see how other people read God's story into their life. In staff meeting, we've been talking about the importance of sharing stories. We've also talked about the importance of challenging our stories. I'm not going to challenge your story. If you tell me the story of your life, I'm not going to say, well, I don't think so. I'm not that dumb. But I think challenging your own story might be a good idea. Challenging your own myths. Because some of it might be not quite right. Self-understanding is so key. It allows us to find courage, to keep humble, to maintain passion. It allows us to remember what is core in our faith and who we are and whose we are. 
and what God is calling us to do. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love, and we, we thank you most for your story, and that you came into the world for us, Lord Jesus, and that you died for us, and that you rose for us, and ascended for us, and that you sit at the right hand of the Father, and intercede, intercede on our behalf, because you care for us deeply. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.